Hi, I'm Nicole Goche, Professor of Plant Pathology at the University of Kentucky. Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, managing diseases without fungicides. So this is kind of the part one of a two-part management strategy. Um, I am going to prepare a separate talk on uh, managing with fungicides or biologicals. This is uh, a focus on cultural practices. So I'm calling this considerations and concepts. And if you've already watched um, the video Disease 101, this is just a deeper dive into those very same concepts. Um, I can't stress enough how important these things are, whether you're going to use fungicides or you're going to be um, no spray, um, whatever you're going to do, indoor, outdoor, this is going to be the critical um, Plant Pathology 101, or in this case 102, uh, to understand the disease cycle. And by understanding the biology and the disease cycle, it's much easier than to manage your cultural conditions, your environment, uh, so that you can prevent and or manage disease. So let's start at the very beginning. What is a disease? A disease is a disorder. It's a plant's reaction to something. Um, we can say malady or abnormality or disorder. It's a plant's reaction. So it's the wilt, it's the rot, it's the necrosis or the chlorosis. So that is the, the plant's reaction. That's what disease is. That's why sometimes you see that we call several diseases the same thing, right? We call multiple things blights or we call multiple things leaf spots. And those, those disease names then don't really define the causal agent and it doesn't differentiate between, for example, one disease and another or one pathogen and another. So disease, we use, uh, even sometimes we use different terms to describe the same thing. Every region, every state, every grower group might have different colloquial names for uh, the same thing or we might have the same name for different things. Um, but disease is different than pathogen. Disease, again, is the symptom. It's a plant's reaction, whereas the sign is the actual uh, pathogen that we see. It's rare that we see individual propagules. So, right, we don't see an individual um, fungal spore, for example, but sometimes we'll see masses of spores. This is powdery mildew in this image. And by mildew, we're just looking at a mass of mycelia and spore, um, and, and spore uh, structures. So there's, there's spores in there, or canidia is the name of those particular spores. Canidia fours, those are the stalks that hold up those chains of canidia. And then the mycelia, those are those thread-like fungal bodies that we see. So a mold is actually a sign we're looking at the fungus. So very, uh, it isn't very often that we see the actual signs of a fungus with our naked eye. Um, so in the field or in the greenhouse, you, you're typically not going to see a lot of fun, fungal signs, but um, the signs are what we need to properly diagnose a plant pathogen. That's what your plant disease diagnostic lab is going to do. It's where microscopes come in um, or even molecular techniques to be able to detect, uh, for example, fungal DNA. Um, so the sign is what we need. It's the actual fungus. That's what we're searching for. You may not, often cannot get to that point um, at the grower level simply because you don't have the equipment. But the symptoms is what you're going to see. That's what's going to alert you. But that is not going to be a diagnostic um, technique. So I talked about this earlier, and I can't talk about this too much, is the disease triangle. The disease triangle is a, is a concept we use in uh, plant pathology to describe what constitutes a disease. And so just like a triangle. So with a triangle, you need three sides to have a triangle. In order to um, not have a triangle anymore, you break one side, and then you no longer have a triangle. So if we use that same concept for a disease, um, if we break one side of the disease triangle, we no longer have disease. So if we're gonna think about managing disease, we think about which of the sides of the triangle we can break. Now we can attempt to break multiple sides and sometimes it's really difficult to completely break a side, but all attempts are fair game. 
So let's start on the left, the pathogen. We must have the pathogen in place to have disease. Now the pathogen, the disease is there, right? So there's no infection, there's no um, fungi, bacteria, virus, nematode, water mold. So we can break that side of the triangle, for example, by eliminating the pathogen altogether, right? We can prune away disease plant parts. We can prevent the pathogen from coming in for, to, uh, to our greenhouse, for example. Um, we can use fungicides. Uh, so there are a lot of ways to remove or eliminate the pathogen side of the triangle. On the right, we've got host. So in order to remove or to break that side of the disease triangle, we would remove the host or, or remove the susceptible host tissue. So um, there might be uh, resistance, cultural or cultivar resistance, sorry, cultivar resistance. Um, some, of our, some of our hemp, for example, are resistant to certain pathogens um, or, or tolerant. Sometimes it's plant age. Sometimes it's the tissue type. Uh, so we have some differences in uh, host tissue. But if we can break that side of the disease triangle, then, of course, we have uh, eliminated or stopped disease from spreading. And then finally, there's environment. So um, in a nutshell, uh, pathogens need, especially fungi and bacteria and water molds, they need two things to complete their life cycle. They need moderate temperatures and free water. And by moderate temperatures, that is something comfortable for a human, right? So 60 or 65 degrees until eh, 75 or 80 degrees. Typically, if it's colder than that, um, plant pathogens are not active. It doesn't mean they're dead, they're dormant or, or latent. And then if it's too hot, they'll also go dormant. They'll shut down, uh, often not die. They'll develop some kind of survival structure. But that active, that active zone um, is the same comfort level that we have. So if you're comfortable, your pathogen is comfortable. And, and when it's comfortable, it can, um, it can spread, it can infect, and it can sporulate. And by sporulate, produce spores or whatever the propagule needed for it to uh, reproduce. And then the second environmental condition, like I said, is free water. Free water is anywhere that there is um, tangible or sufficient moisture for the pathogen to complete its life cycle. That can be uh, rain. Rain is the most obvious one. Overhead irrigation um, and in terms of soil, any kind of soil moisture. Um, it can also mean fog, dew, or just relative humidity. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but uh, your typical fungus is gonna require at least 70% humidity to complete its life cycle or for that active zone to infect, to reproduce. Um, and um, bacteria, water molds, and some fungi at about 85% relative humidity. So relative humidity is really critical you can um, think about relative humidity in terms of microclimates. Maybe the lower bench in your greenhouse or under the bench of the greenhouse, or maybe a shaded part of the field or inside of a dense canopy, right? Our, our relative humidity gets higher as we, our, our canopies begin to close uh, later in the season. So microclimates also fall in there. So monitoring, um, monitoring temperature and especially humidity is another way that we can um, manipulate and break that side of the disease triangle. So let's look at each side of the disease triangle separately. Let's talk a little bit more about this. Um, again, in the Disease 101 video, I went through this really quickly, so I'm going to take just a little bit more time, kind of drive home those points. Um, so your pathogens, the pathogen side of the disease triangle, uh, fungi, bacterial, water molds, viruses, and nematodes. Those are your, your general group of plant pathogens. By the way, this is black root rot on this image. So um, those propagules there, so this is a microscopic image of a root, and those are those propagules inside of that root. Uh, fun fact, anytime a propagule is dark colored, it's melanized. And think about melanin in our skin. So uh, melanized uh, propagules are generally much more heat tolerant, cold tolerant, UV tolerant, and they will typically be fungicide tolerant as well. So the darker they are, the tougher they are. So that's kind of a rule of thumb. And with black root rot, um, they are really tough, really hard to manage. Okay, so let's break down our pathogens a little bit. 
fungi. Fungi are the most common of all of our plant pathogens. Um, I think 80 or 85% of our plant pathogens are, tend to be fungal. Um, so fungi um, are different, by the way, than all of our other pathogens. So when we talk about fungicides or we talk about fungi, we mean true fungi. And I'll tell you a little bit about what's not a true fungus a little bit later. So uh, fungi, um, again, 70% relative humidity is kind of that threshold. Um, they usually produce some type of spore. Sometimes they'll produce multiple types of spores. Um, and in this powdery mildew, for example, they produce an asexual spore called conidia. And those will be repeating spores. So as long as the temperature and moisture is sufficient enough, they will keep producing spores all year. Um, other types and, and even powdery mildew will produce another type of spore. So these, these um, fun, this fungi will, fungus will go into a dormancy in wintertime and it will produce a, an overwintering structure that will protect it from adverse um, environmental conditions. And in the spring, um, a sexual spore will develop. So that's, that's when sexual recombination occurs. So that's kind of that initiating um, infection in the year. So some of our fungi will produce those types of spores as well. Um, many of our fungi will overwinter on site, whether in the greenhouse or in the field, often in debris that falls down to the soil line or attached to any um, plant part that's still in the field. Um, if you're in a greenhouse, you'll have maybe a green bridge. So the fungus will jump from host to host or even weeds or anything underneath the bench. So fungi do survive. They will typically go dormant um, in the winter and in the springtime when temperatures become moderate and um, moisture becomes available, they'll wake up or they'll break that dormancy and they'll begin again. Whereas greenhouse um, and indoor production, you usually have that continuous cycle of plants. So the, um, the, fungal, uh, the fungus will move from um, crop to crop. Um, fungi can be either, um, either have broad host ranges or they can have very narrow host ranges. It depends what it is. And um, this video is not meant to go down to every single little, um, every single little, um, uh, fungal disease that we see in cannabis, but I will put a few links in the description. And then that way, if you have something in particular, um, you can see kind of what that biology is and maybe how that, that fungus will overwinter or how it survives or what that host range is. Bacteria are less common. We have a few bacterial diseases in, um, in cannabis, not many. Uh, bacteria are different than fungi because they don't produce spores and they don't produce that thread-like um, hyphal body that we typically see. Um, bacteria uh, need much more water to, um, to infect um, than fungi, so 85% relative humidity, humidity is typical. Um, a lot of our bacterial diseases need a little bit higher temperatures than uh, some of our fungi do. Uh, when they infect, they can eat, they usually infect through stomates or some type of opening and they will go into the plant cells. And that's where they'll multiply into these single cell type propagules and bacteria um, will, will just really move. So they'll ooze out through natural openings and they will move around on films of water. So uh, when you have a bacterial disease, being careful not to use, not to work when plants are wet, not to move that, that, um, those propagules around with your hands or with your tools. So this is kind of where we usually recommend um, uh, sanitizing pruners in between pruning cuts, those type of things. That's generally when we start talking about bacteria. Again, there are only a few bacterial diseases that we see in cannabis. So lucky for that, um, bacteria are typically managed um, with a bacteria side or a, um, an antibiotic, which are not like not labeled by the way for any cannabis. Uh, we have a couple of um, biologicals that are semi um, effective. Bacteria in particular though must be prevented. So once you have a bacterial disease, it's unlikely that you'll get any kind of management from, um, from a copper or from um, a bacteria side. Water molds or oomycetes as, as we call them. Um, water molds look like fungi. 
um, to, to most people, um, they still have that thread-like body. They produce some type of propagule and some type of spore, and um, they're very easily confused with fungi um, by a lot of people, but they are different. They're, in, they're particularly different in terms of management, and that's why we separate them out. Water molds are very commonly our, um, a lot of our root rots, um, downy mildew, pythium, phytophthora. Those are our three really common water molds. Now, don't get confused. There are fungal root rots. There are fungal mildews. So these water molds, again, the downy mildews, pythium, and phytophthora are, are generally in that category. There are some others, but in cannabis, those are the big three. Pythium and Phytophthora are your root rots or crown rots. And then downy mildew, of course, is a, um, is a leaf mold, if you will. And in terms of, of the root rots or the water molds, water molds are called water molds uh, clearly because they love water. Um, they need a lot of water to complete their life cycle, at least 85%, but really it's the saturated soil. It's the high water level. Same with downy mildew, very high humidity. Um, is where we're going to see these, these water molds. So think water mold water. Um, and, and once you have that infection, though, you even if you dry that soil out, once infection occurs, um, it, it's really too late. So this is an image of, um, of roots, and they're kind of upside down. So right, the, the roots are pointing up in this image. And if you look at the very top, the top right, there's a, um, there's a root where the cortex has sloughed off and you see just the steel sticking out. Uh, we call that rat tail. And uh, there's another one on the bottom. That is a pythium infected hemp root. And um, you see the one on the, um, on the right that's starting to turn brown. So we're starting to see that root death here, but the sloughing off of the root, pretty typical of pythium. Um, pythium, um, or, or a lot of, a lot of pathogens, um, pythium is my example here. Um, the propagules, um, get mixed in, they, they're in the soil, they get mixed in the soil or some of this root debris and they move around any way that soil moves around. So a lot of times, a, a hose dr dragging around the greenhouse floor, used pots, um, dirty tires, dirty wheels, dirty, um, equipment. Uh, benches and surfaces that are not cleaned in between um, in between crops. That's when you're going to see a lot of these soil-borne pathogens, water mold and, and soil-borne fungi. So you're going to see them move around the greenhouse or, or the field, and that's where they're going to move from crop to crop. So once you have Pythium, Phytophthora, or any other fungal um, soil-borne pathogen established, it's going to move around any way that soil or soilless media will. So think about anything that's root bound or, or soil borne, um, it's gonna move around that same way. And when we think about water molds, we always really think about Pythium in particular. Um, we don't see as much downy mildew or when we do, it's in the upper plant parts and that's a little bit easier to wrap our heads around. But root rots are hard because we don't really see a root rot unless we're checking for a root rot. Um, so again, be careful of moving soil around. And once you have these kinds of uh, soil borne pathogens um, to really think about the way you move soil and, uh, and debris around because that's where it's hitchhiking around in those, um, in those materials. Viruses, um, not as common in the Southeast. Again, I'm here in Kentucky and um, in the southeast, we don't have many viruses. Um, in the on the west coast, we see a lot more the curly top and uh, hoplite and viroid. Uh, we don't see a lot of viruses here um, in the southeast. I am going to say that viruses are systemic. Once a plant is infected by a virus, the whole plant is infected. You can no longer use that plant for um, propagation, for example, and you cannot cure it. No matter what, you cannot cure a viral infection. So uh, plants need to be discarded as soon as a virus is detected. A couple of things about viruses that they're vectored or they're moved around in uh, ways that are different from our fungi and bacteria and water molds. Um, viruses can be vectored by insects. Uh, some viruses are specifically vectored by aphids. Some are specifically uh, vectored by thrips 
or specifically, for example, uh, vectored by the beet leaf hopper. Um, and then others are vectored mechanically. So by propagation materials or by pruners, um, even by touch. Um, so, so knowing specifically about individual viruses is important. Um, a virus isn't a virus isn't a virus. So um, as, as um, if you suspect viruses, it's very important that you talk to a diagnostician or to your county agent or consultant. They can uh, get you into contact with one and get samples submitted because these are the most complicated of all of our uh, plant pathogens. We're lucky we don't have many viruses affecting cannabis, but when we do, it's very difficult. All right, so let's move to the next uh, side of the disease triangle, the host. And when I talk about the host and breaking the host side of the triangle, it doesn't just mean the whole plant. It can mean um, what plant part or the plant or the plant parts age. So let's start with roots. Well, if you've got a root rot, you need roots in order for it to infect. Um, however, uh, to be a little bit more specific, very often either a wounded root. Um, if you have nematodes, for example, they create a lesion that the um, certain soil-borne pathogens can enter through the root. Um, pythium, for example, will usually enter into that uh, growing tip of the root, so something you can't really control. Um, so yes, you need roots for a root rot to occur, but sometimes it's a, it's a specific uh, area. Root wounds, if you will, um, or stressed roots will typically be more susceptible. Stems, so there are stem and crown. I'm going to put crowns in there. And crown is essentially the stem right at the soil line. So anything, um, twig, branch, stem, whatever word you want to use. So once we start thinking about those, um, once we start thinking about those woody plant parts, it's very different than some of the other uh, tissue. Uh, usually our um, stem rots or our crown rots are going to um, be caused or, or initiated somewhere where there's a wound. Um, that could be a pruning cut, it could be an insect wound, or it can be mechanical damage at the crown area. So think about, um, think about how that pathogen might get in. Um, I have even seen um, plastic culture fields where the plastic has just rubbed enough against a very tender young stem and that, um, that wound uh, remained open and then later in the season when we got hot, um, hot weather, rainy July, uh, Rhizoctonia moved in. So a wound in, in the early season might be um, an entry point for a, a pathogen, but the disease or the symptoms might not show up until later. So um, in terms of stems, just really think about wounding, especially mechanical wounding. Those are some things that we as humans, as, as the growers can control. Leaves, well, this is the one we all know, right? So we always see leaf spots. We always see leaf problems. Um, it's just, it, it's what we see um, most often. Sometimes leaves um, are, are, are wilted or blighted or there's a marginal leaf scorch as a result of say a root rot. Um, but leaf spots and leaf blights can absolutely be caused by um, fungal, bacterial, or worm or pathogens. This image, this is um, downy mildew. And um, so as you kind of um, start knowing what your plants look like, and this one, you see that the necrosis and the chlorosis is delimited by the leaf veins. So it's kind of blocky, if you will. Very wet. Uh, this is a water mold, downy mildew. But so your leaf spots, your leaf blights, and your leaf diseases can be, um, again, it can be uh, um, oh, any of your pathogens. Uh, typically, your viruses, for example, uh, will manifest uh, most severely in young leaf tissue. Um, depending on the pathogen, um, entry will be uh, sometimes a very aggressive pathogen. will just enter right into a leaf. Young leaves are typically more susceptible, but your older leaves are often what's going to show uh, leaf spots, for, fungal leaf spots, for example, first. And that's simply because they were infected earlier and they're down on the bottom of the canopy where there's a higher humidity, there's shade. So think about the microclimate. So lower leaves typically is where you're going to see a lot of um, 
a lot of disease symptoms, but younger leaves are often more susceptible. That's a rule of thumb. It's not an absolute. Uh, every pathogen is different, but um, the older your leaves are, the, the thicker that cuticle becomes, the tougher they get, and generally that's not the time that infection would occur. Um, but there's exceptions to every rule. So um, think about um, what, think and, and know the biology of whatever disease you're battling, how infection occurs, where infection occurs, and that'll help you a little bit. So leaves come in all shapes and sizes and ages, and they, they um, consume the most of your plant. Okay, and finally, the last host part I'm gonna talk about are flowers. Um, most of the time we're growing cannabis for either flowers or for the grain. And um, the grain is part of that flower head or that inflorescence. Um, so when we think about flowers, there are different flower parts. They're um, very often what we call the sugar leaves or the leaves that are within that flower head or in that inflorescence. Then within the flower or the seed itself, there are many plant parts within that flower. Um, so thinking about the bracts and the um, just the different, the stem inside there. So anything within that flower, um, the, the denser a flower will get, the higher the internal humidity will get, less airflow, um, less coverage if you're spraying fungicides. So um, you can very well see that the bigger, denser flowers um, or, or seed heads or flower heads are uh, typically most prone to disease. It's, you know, again, it's a microclimate thing most of the time. So being able to pull that flower apart and to really look in there as you're scouting to see what's going on, what plant, what flower parts are actually infected. Um, but the denser a flower head gets, the more susceptible or, or the more prone it would be to, um, especially fungal diseases is what we're seeing. Okay, and finally, environment, the third side of the disease triangle. Um, and as I said earlier, and as I said on the previous video, um, the primary things you need to think about in terms of environment, we need moderate temperatures and free water. Moderate temperatures means somewhere between 65 and uh, 75 or 80 degrees. Um, some pathogens like it a little bit on the cooler side, some like it a little bit on the warmer side. Um, but in general, anything lower than 60 and higher than 85 or 80, 85, um, pathogens are going to shut down. Um, so that that moderate temperature is just what we need. Typically springtime, early summer are great for pathogens, um, bad for the grower, but as summer comes around, it usually gets hotter. We have uh, less activity. Now, if infection already occurred, you can still have disease, but the actual infection and the, um, and the activity of the pathogen, at least on the outside, would be much lower, but a summer rain or some cloudy days are going to change those temperatures. So we can't just say that there's no, there's no disease in the summer. So it's really all temperature and moisture driven, which brings me to talk about free water. Uh, free water, again and again and again, I keep repeating, is um, rain, overhead irrigation, um, saturated soil or wet soil. It can be humidity, it can be fog, dew, 70% is kind of your threshold for most fungi, um, less than 70%, and it's really easy to manipulate your greenhouse. It's less easy to manipulate in the field, but 70% is usually your threshold for most fungi and for uh, water molds and bacteria. It's typically 85%. Um, if you read the biology or some of our fact sheets on all of their pathogens, we'll tell you specifically if there's something different. Um, but even in the field, you can space plants for air circulation. You can prune for air circulation. You can uh, think about morning shade if there's maybe a tree line on the east side of your, um, of your field. So anything you can do to dry leaves off more readily. Um, good drainage, internal drainage, and good surface drainage. Uh, we did talk about some root rots a little bit, so uh, we always think about leaves. We don't think about roots as much because they're out of sight, out of mind. So saturated soil is also a component when we talk about environment, right? The root environment is actually the soil or soil is media. So manipulating your environment, if you can, trying to break that final, third and final side of the disease triangle. 
Okay, so moderate temperatures. I've kind of repeated this already. This image is botrytis or gray mold. So it loves humidity. Botrytis is a fungal pathogen. 85% is its threshold. And um, fungicides won't work if you don't uh, lower your humidity and, um, and that temperature. And as well, um, botrytis, for example, likes cool nights and warmer days. So again, temperature, environment, uh, free water. This one is a pythium root rot in a seed tray. Um, and this is a, um, this is a used seed tray that wasn't cleaned and the pathogen is moving from season to season, but pythium again likes water. And um, so this is very wet, as you can kind of see, this is a float tray as a matter of fact. So um, pythium loves water, it's a water mold. And guess what we get? We get lots of, <laughs> we get lots of root rot in those cases. So again, environment really important. So to sum it up, disease triangle, three, three parts of the disease triangle. Your goal is to break any side of the disease triangle completely. The more you can do, the better. Uh, eliminate the pathogen, prevent it from coming in, or try to, uh, try to eradicate it if it comes in. Eradication is a myth, but we can get as close as possible. Host or um, whether it's cultivar or a susceptible um, plant part, think about that as you go. Sometimes later planting, sometimes um, just manipulating just a little bit, avoiding wounding, those types of things. And then your environment, free water, moderate temperatures are your key there in the environmental um, side of the disease triangle. Okay, so in summary, we're managing disease. How do we manage disease? I've given you all of these concepts. How do we manage disease? Well, most of the time we can't completely control disease. We're kind of managing, right? So once a pathogen is there, once disease develops, we can't just eradicate it. It doesn't go away. Um, we use cultural practices and that's what the disease triangle is all about. If, we, if there are resistant cultivars or, um, you know, in some other, some other crops, resistant species that will uh, be less susceptible to uh, certain diseases or certain pathogens. Uh, a fallow period between crops. Sometimes we rotate our crops on a two or three year basis in the field, depending on the pathogen that's been our problem, and in the greenhouse to completely empty your greenhouse in between crops. Uh, sanitation. Sanitation means clean, keep it clean. Clean under the benches, clean um, between the rows, sweep, um, sanitize uh, or disinfest or disinfect your greenhouse or indoor space between crops. Um, Roguing. If a plant looks bad, get it out. Don't wait. Don't try to cure it because if it's infected, then whatever your fungus or bacterium will start to uh, multiply and then it'll start to spread. So the faster you get it out, the less chance you have of spread. As you're planning, as you're planting, uh, block everything. So if you have, for example, a, um, maybe um, infected seed that came in or you have an outbreak of a disease, you can eliminate a certain block. So that would be the same age or the same cultivar or um, maybe the same um, planting date. That would be, that's how you would block. That way you don't have a mixing within your farm or your, your facility. Um, so if there is a problem, if there is a, a, an outbreak of some disease, you can eliminate by block. You'll understand a little bit better what's going on. Uh, you can, it'll help you trace back to maybe the origin, what happened, and then to really stop the spread. Uh, once you have disease, the key is, dis is stopping the spread. Um, disinfecting, I said this, disinfect your tools, disinfect your surfaces um, in your fallow period in any indoor facility to uh, disinfect all surfaces in the entire facility. We do have a publication on disinfecting. I will post that in the uh, description. Environmental conditions, we've talked about that at length. Um, your environmental conditions are your temperature and your free water. And then of course, ideally is avoidance. Don't bring it in in the first place. Um, and we can all say that, right? Hindsight's 2020. But really being careful of what you bring in, checking plants, um, checking clones before they come into the facility, uh, knowing your seed source. And if you ever suspect there might be a problem, develop a quarantine unit or quarantine some things out uh, before you mix it in with other, um, with other healthy plants. And then of course there's fungicides. I know that's always the burning question with a lot of people. Uh, first of all, fungicides don't cure disease. Once disease develops, uh, fungicides at best can only be a Band-Aid. 
Um, fungicides can be natural or synthetic. Um, they depend, um, their, their effectiveness uh, depends on their persistence, how long they stick around. Um, safety, right? Um, um, they, they're actually the labeling, um, whether they penetrate the plant or whether they're on the surface. Um, a lot of our fungicides now are specific to certain pathogens. They're not broad spectrum like they used to be for so long. Um, we can also think about um, the inert ingredients. So think about copper fungicides, for example. Um, not all formulations are labeled for certain for everything. Um, so inert ingredients really make a difference on how effective they are and whether they can cause phytotoxicity or even if they're labeled at all. And um, we're not really going to get into FRAC codes. FRACs is, is your um, is your group, your chemical group. Um, not a lot of um, chemical fungicides labeled for cannabis or hemp. Um, I think that's coming down the pipeline. But again, regardless of which fungicides are available, which ones we can use, um, all of the cultural practices we've talked about the last 30 minutes or what's important first. And then if you choose a fungicide, again, make sure it's labeled. And if it is, you still have to, you still have to use cultural practices. Fungicides can't stand alone. Okay, so in closing, um, there are a lot of resources available. Um, we're getting closer and closer of having, um, having some good um, recommendations for both hemp and cannabis growers um, since legalization has been creeping up on us. Your experience though is priceless, knowing what healthy plants look like. Um, always ask. Um, there are a lot of things, especially in disease identification or pathogen identification that you, you won't know, and that's okay. Um, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of people out there now that you can ask, not a neighbor, um, but actually an expert, a plant pathologist, your county agent, your um, plant disease diagnostic lab, your consultant. Um, expect that there's a lot of changes in this industry. We have cultivars that are here today and gone tomorrow. We have a lot of products. We have a lot of a lot of things going on. And also our recommendations change as we learn more and more. So get ready for change. Um, don't don't believe forever what you once heard because things do change and we're, we're happy for that. That's a really positive thing. As we learn more, we get it out there. And just keep learning. Find the literature, find research-based information. And um, there are a lot of social media and, and, and virtual sites that will actually share uh, science-based information. So keep learning, um, keep on top of it, and um, good luck with your crop. And we'll see you in the next video. Thank you.